you know, whatever. We'll figure it out. Okay. All right, everyone, we're going to get started. I think it's 12.15. Yeah, we're good. Um, all right, thank you for being here today. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Alex Contasta. Um, Dr. Contasta is both a colleague and friend of mine, and I am really excited to have her here. Um, she is a research assistant professor um, at UNH's Earth Systems Research Center. Uh, her research focuses on the interactions between land use and climate, um, with an emphasis on carbon sequestration, which is something that I know in particular in the AFE program here, we're all really interested in uh, carbon sequestration, climate change, how can ag contribute to solutions, um, which I think is part of what Dr. Contasta is going to talk about. So I will let her take it from here. Thank you. Uh, can everybody hear me? Okay. Wonderful. So I am going to um, talk about the potential for pasture management to increase soil carbon storage, focusing on dairy farms in New England, so in our part of the world. But before I jump into that, I just want to start off with a little bit of definitions and motivation. Um, so just to take a step back and sort of make sure we're all on the same page. When I'm talking about soil carbon, some of you might be wondering, huh? Although maybe some of you aren't. Maybe some of you have more training in this than I realize. But when I'm talking about soil carbon, I am, yes, in some ways talking about soil organic matter. So soils are made of lots of different things, mineral particles, air, water, and also organic material. And organic matter is this organic component. And it includes the living organisms, microbes primarily, and also lots of material, mostly from plants, at various stages of decomposition. And this soil organic matter is very important. It's important as an energy and nutrient source um, for microbes and for plants. It's important for um, uh, uh, how water moves across the landscape, for, for storage of water and for infiltration. And it's also really important for providing soil with structure, allowing for root growth, and allowing soil to hold together in aggregates so that it doesn't blow away on the wind. But carbon is one of the key ingredients in this soil organic matter. So um, this is just a, a schematic representation of how carbon gets into um, organic matter and how it, how it leaves. So you have carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. There's your carbon. And you have photosynthesis by plants that takes up that carbon dioxide and puts it into plant material. Those plants die, and so you have some plant litter, some of that's above ground, some of that's roots below ground. And then you have hungry microbes, and those hungry microbes like to eat the plants. They, they decompose the plants, and some of the byproducts of that decomposition get stabilized in soil organic matter. So that carbon is flowing from the atmosphere through plants, microbes, and into soil organic matter. But as the microbes decompose the litter, they breathe, and a lot of what they um, uh, respire is carbon dioxide, and that returns back to the atmosphere, so you have this nice little carbon cycle. Microbes also decompose not just fresh litter, but also some of the carbon inorganic matter, and some of that carbon also returns to the atmosphere. So carbon is one of the key ingredients in soil organic matter. And my talk is focusing on the potential to store carbon through pasture management, but um, I think it's important to ask why we would want to do this, why increase the amount of carbon in soil. And the simple answer is that we have too much of it in the atmosphere. So this is the Keeling curve. Um, this is a, um, a graph of carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere that have been measured in Mauna Loa in Hawaii starting in the 1950s and going to present day. And I have some different um, points plotted on the, this curve that represent um, times in my life just to show how CO2 has increased in the atmosphere over my lifetime. So I was born in 1976, so I'm dating myself now. Um, and I was a, so I was a bicentennial baby, and I was born in Philadelphia, so there's my little Liberty Bell. And when I was born, CO2 was 330 parts per million in the atmosphere. Fast forward to when I started graduate school at UNH, and that was in 2005, and CO2 is now 380 parts per million. So it's increased by 50 ppm um, over the course of you know me being born to being 20 something years old. Um, and then uh, now that I'm faculty at UNH, when I teach classes, the number I give my students for how much CO2 in the atmosphere is about 410 ppm. 
So over the course of my life, I've seen a lot of, we've seen a big increase in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And this increase in carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases has all kinds of consequences. Um, we see increases in temperature, we see changes in precipitation regimes, and we see sea level rise, just as a quick summary. And that can have all kinds of impacts on our forests, on our coasts, on agriculture, on water resources, on biodiversity, and on our own health. And obviously, I'm glossing over this, but climate change, which is driven by increases in um, atmospheric carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, is a really big deal, right? So, so getting some of that CO2 out of the atmosphere is really important. There was a group of researchers at Stanford who, no, Princeton, Princeton, who had this great idea to, um, you know, break up some of the solutions for mitigating climate change into these wedges. So the idea being that you could pick um, wedges, like you would choose pieces of a pie, and, you know, through certain combinations of them, you could offset CO2 emissions and remove CO2 through the atmosphere. And a lot of those options include increased energy efficiency, by um, scrubbing power plant exhaust, by maybe storing carbon in the deep oceans, through some geoengineering, through renewable energy. But one of the solutions is through soil carbon storage, right? And that's in this sort of agriculture and forestry area. And this is in part possible because, or the idea is that it's possible because we've lost a lot of organic matter from our soils historically. So this is a figure showing soil carbon density in grams per square meter in the U.S. Corn Belt. This would be in the Midwestern part of the United States, starting in the early 20th century and then going all the way up to about 1990. And so when you convert this, um, the native ecosystem, which would have been prairie, into agriculture and you start tilling those fields, you start to lose soil carbon very dramatically. You bottom out in the 1950s, and then you start to maybe increase that carbon through um, reduced tillage and other conservation practices. And so this would be an example of how we lost a lot of carbon through land management and land use change, and how we also may be able to regain it through some of those mechanisms. But carbon loss can also be driven by other factors. It can be driven by climate warming, by increased CO2 in the atmosphere, by changing precipitation through invasive species, lots of different mechanisms. But since my talk is focused on land management, this is one that I'm thinking about the most. Okay, so if you want to store carbon in soil, then you need to know what controls how much of it there is. And really simply, what controls the amount of um, organic matter and organic carbon in soil is the balance between inputs and outputs. And it, that's a very sort of general idea, but and very simple. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's kind of what it is. So you have plant productivity, removing CO2 from the atmosphere, putting it in soil, and then you have respiration of that CO2 back out into the atmosphere. So that simple carbon cycle that I showed before. And this movement of carbon in and out of the soil organic matter, soil organic carbon pool is mediated by microbes. So again, it's quite simply the balance between inputs and outputs. So if you want to increase the amount of carbon in your soil, you can think of it as deposit depositing more carbon into the soil bank than you withdraw. You want to put more in than you take out. And you can do that by trying to increase you know, plant productivity and reduce the amount that's lost to respiration. And this would be a good thing, right? We know that we need to do something about the carbon problem we have in the atmosphere. And so if feasible, and I think that's a big if, um, storing carbon in soil through agricultural management could be a tool for mitigating climate change, among other tools. And it could also offer a lot of other benefits. So soil organic matter is really fundamental to soil health. And so it's not just about putting carbon in the soil bank, it's also increasing organic matter in soil, which is important for nutrients, resources, for the management of water, um, for, for preventing erosion. So you get all these other additional benefits. And this is a really hot topic right now, and I think some of you are learning about this in your classes. You know, this is something that is talked about in policy circles. So this is something that was talked about at the UN Conference of Parties. So the United Nations Framework um, Convention on Climate Change try to increase the amount of carbon that's stored in soil as one way to, um, to offset the amount of CO2 that's in the atmosphere, the four per meal approach. And it's also big business, 
right? So um, it has the potential to be really profitable for investors, maybe for farmers. So, um, you know, this is just a, a, an image of a um, news article in CNBC about a company here in Boston called Indigo that introduced its Terraton initiative, um, a $15 trillion opportunity to help farmers mitigate climate change, right? So it's, it's in policy, it's also big business. So it could be a good thing. Um, one of the things that I'm really interested in is not just how can it happen, but um, does it have unintended consequences? So um, this is a figure just sort of showing you how I think increasing organic carbon in soil may have some trade-offs. This is from a modeling study that Chang Chen Li and others published in 2005. And so the x-axis is showing observed nitrous oxide fluxes. These are fluxes of greenhouse gases um, that are not CO2, they're nitrogen-based greenhouse gases. These are observed annual fluxes on the x-axis and then stimulated because those are modeled emissions on the y. And those different points are um, uh, different um, soils with different amounts of soil organic carbon. The ones that are um, not shaded, that are white, have lower amounts of carbon, and the ones that are dark have more. And the, the, the um, soils that had more carbon also had higher nitrous oxide emissions. In part, and this is um, sort of a simplistic explanation, but in part this is because carbon and nitrogen are friends, and they like to go places together in the environment. So wherever carbon goes, nitrogen also likes to go. And if you're trying to increase the amount of carbon in soil by increasing the amount of inputs you're putting in through crops and crop residues, you also might be increasing the amount of nitrogen in soil and, you know, influencing the nitrogen cycle, not just the carbon cycle. So this is just a, a simple view of the nitrogen cycle. And without getting into all the specifics, if you do that, you may end up with more releases of nitrous oxide from the soil. And that would not be a good thing because nitrous oxide is also a greenhouse gas that's extremely powerful. So um, it has um, estimates vary. Here, this figure showed 265 times the global warming potential of carbon dioxide. So increases in nitrous oxide in the atmosphere would be negative, right? If you're trying to if you're trying to mitigate climate change and you end up in releasing more N2O, that would not be a good thing. And so our study is trying to address a lot of these questions. We're asking, does a particular type of pasture management called management-intensive grazing increase soil carbon storage? And if so, are there trade-offs? And um, I just want to acknowledge some of the co-authors and collaborators on this work um, before I get started, because this has been very much a team effort. And now I'm going to get into a little bit of sort of rationale for this particular study. So why pasture? Why are we focused on pasture management? Well, first and foremost, it dominates global agricultural land. So this, um, this schematic is showing um, global ice-free land surface. So how much land that doesn't have glaciers on it is comprised of different land uses. The pink one is developed areas infrastructure. That's about 1%. Croplands, and those could be irrigated or not irrigated. Those are about 12%. Plantation forests and other managed forests are about 22%. And then um, sort of unforested, unmanaged, uh, unforested, unmanaged ecosystems and also unmanaged forests, those are about 28%. But the biggest land use we see, the biggest bar, that's all pasture, right? So that's about 37% of the global ice free land use. So we have a lot of pasture um, on Earth. And in New England, that's also true. So pasture is also one of the dominant agricultural land uses in our own backyard. And we're focusing on a particular type of pasture management. Here I'm calling it rotational grazing. It has lots of names. It could be intensive rotational grazing, management intensive rotational grazing, multi-paddock grazing. It has lots of names, which is in some ways um, makes it difficult to study. But the basic idea, well, in a lot of ways it does, the basic idea is that it's a system of grazing in which a large number of animals move through small paddocks over a short period of time. And so what that means is that here on the um, left-hand side, this would be continuous grazing with no rotation. You put the animals out into the pasture, they're allowed to move freely, 
There's, they, they're not constrained by any fences. Maybe you let them out there for a week, maybe a month, and then you come back and get them. Then you go to a slightly more intensive system where you have some basic rotations. You put in some fencing, usually temporary. You take those same number of animals, but now you have them in a smaller area. And maybe they're there for a week, a few days. The idea behind intensive rotational grazing or management intensive grazing or multi paddock grazing is that you take a very, very high stocking rate of animals, so a very large number of animals in a small, very small area, and you have them there for a very short period, maybe for 12 hours, maybe for 24. And so you would take this pasture, and you could think of it as a checkerboard, and you're going to move the animals from one square to the next. Um, over, uh, you know, each square is only occupied by about a day and the rest of the grass is resting. And so that's the idea behind rotational grazing. And um, I, I guess them being deliberately vague on what stocking rate and how long, because this is super variable. It's as variable, if not more, as how many names there are for how to do this. And it can change from farm to farm, or it can even change within a farm from year to year. If you have a dry year, um, you may have your cows out on larger um, paddocks because there's not as much food. Whereas if you have a wet year and there's lots of grass, you may have them in smaller paddocks. Um, it also changes throughout the season, right? Early in the season when there's more, you know, in May, June, where there's more grass growth, you may have smaller paddocks than later in the season. So this is a very hard thing to define for me and um, a hard thing to study because of that. And I don't think I'm the only one. Um, but that's the idea behind rotational grazing. And the reason why we're focused on it is um, that there may be some reasons that dairy farms, particularly in this region, want to adopt it. So one, there's an idea that it may ease the financial burden in a struggling industry. So this graph is showing the number of dairy farms in all of New England from 1959 to 2007. And you can see there's been a steep decline. If you don't have to buy feed to feed your cows and you can feed them grass instead, they may help reduce some of your overhead costs. It's also something that organic farmers tend to do. So 80% of organic farmers in New England pa practice some kind of rotational grazing. And so this is just a figure showing um, the uh, share of organic dairy farms and milk cows in each sort of region that has a meaningful amount of organic in the US. The Northeast um, has you know, a lot of dairy, organic dairy, compared to the rest of the country. And 80% of those farms are practicing rotational grazing. So we have one of the most dominant agricultural land uses, pasture, um, and the organic dairy farmers that are um, that are utilizing those pastures are using this rotational grazing system. There's also this idea, and in some ways it's a belief that's not often founded in hard data, that intensive rotational grazing can store carbon in soil. This um, picture I have on the left is from a film called The Soil Carbon Cowboys. Has anybody seen this film? No? Okay, so this came out, I was at a, um, a film festival a few years ago, the Wild and Scenic Film Festival in Portsmouth, just ready to watch some movies about rivers, and this was the feature length film. And as it was going, I was thinking deeper and deeper in my feet, like, oh my gosh. Um, it was interesting, it was showing a, a whole, um, group of farmers in the Great Plains who had changed um, their management system to rotational grazing and were seeing some big carbon gains. Um, and so in some ways it was sort of a PR um, campaign to sort of show people how this could be done. These farmers were all starting with fields that had been tilled and then they were putting them into perennial grasses. And so they're starting out with soils that were highly eroded and highly degraded and they were trying to build them back up. So they had this really nice success story. Um, but it's an interesting film, and there's a lot of these sort of things out there in the world, these examples of how you might be able to save climate change through storing um, carbon in soils through, through grazing management. It's also can be used as a marketing tool. So this is just a bottle of milk that's being sold in Marin County. And you know, on the side of the milk bottle, it talks about how they're trying to protect um, ecosystems and fight climate change through carbon farming. Through practices like compost, manure, you know, all kinds of different agricultural management practices. And so there's, there's also sort of an effort to sort of promote the idea that rotational grazing may be able to 
to stop climate change, and so therefore you should buy our products, right? It can be a powerful marketing tool as well. Um, I did say that there's not a whole lot of data on the ground about this, but there are some examples. Um, so this is from a study um, by uh, Tonin and others in 2003, and this was done in Virginia, so in the southeast United States. Four different farms um, where they compared fields that had been managed for, they're calling it management intensive grazing, MIG, um, and then just extensive grazing. So fields where there was no rotation, the cows were just allowed to be out there. And what they saw was that areas that were in MIG that had rotational grazing, those are the unshaded bars, had more carbon in their soils after five years than areas that had been in just a, a traditional grazing system. So there's some evidence out there, not a ton. But there have been very few studies that have demonstrated increased carbon storage with intensive rotational grazing, and certainly not in New England. And then the other piece of this that was motivating for us was to try to explore some of these ecological trade-offs. So there are these hypothesized benefits in the way of increased forage productivity. There's an idea that if you graze animals in this way, you may be able to increase forage production, which would be good if you're you know, a farmer and you're trying to feed cows. This increased forage productivity can also mean increased root production below ground. And all those roots are going to die, and that litter is going to decompose, and that decomposition may help to feed the soil and increase soil carbon storage. But then we also have these hypothesized drawbacks that maybe you have higher greenhouse gas emissions, especially of nitrous oxide. And so um, I'm going to talk about three projects that we've done in this study to try to address some of these um, some of these questions we have about the potential for rotational grazing to increase carbon storage and to explore potential trade-offs. So one, I'm going to talk about a study that um, allowed us to look at soil carbon storage and nitrous oxide losses across three dairy farms in New England. Second, we had the chance to resample a farm um, that had been um, measured before its transition into rotational grazing. So we were able to look at changes in soil carbon and nitrogen over time. And third, um, we have been doing some modeling to explore how you might use rotational grazing to try to increase carbon storage in these systems and what you might do to minimize potential trade-offs. Okay, so project one, this is where we're looking at patterns of soil carbon storage and nitrous oxide losses across the three New England dairy farms. So here's the location of our farms. Um, there's one in southern Vermont, one in southern New Hampshire, one in coastal Maine. These farms are pretty similar in terms of their climate. They're somewhat different in the soil types that um, are in place. So the Vermont farm has um, sandy loam soil primarily. Um, the farm in New Hampshire, that's the UNH Organic Dairy Research Farm, has much coarser texture. It, a lot of it is actually loamy sand. So um, it's, uh, it's not even a loam, it's a loamy sand. Um, and then uh, the, the farm in Maine um, has more uh, silty um, loam. So we have sort of a range of different soil textures, which maybe provide a range of different potential conditions to operate in. The farm in Vermont is a private family farm. The UNH Organic Dairy Farm is a university farm. And the farm in Maine is Wolf's Neck Farm, which is an educational farm. So at each of these farms, we measured a lot of things. Um, so you can imagine one of these farms we, um, you know, being broken up into a bunch of different fields that are managed in different ways for different purposes. This is obviously an idealized farm. It doesn't really look like this. Um, but at each farm, we picked two fields that were in continuous hay management and two fields that were in grazing management. And that grazing was supposed to be intensive rotational grazing or management intensive grazing or multi-cat grazing or whatever. Um, and then within each field, we um, focused on three study plots. And then in each plot, we measured the inputs into the system, so plant productivity. We measured the outputs in terms of the greenhouse gas emissions coming out of these soils, carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide. And then we looked at the total stock, what's in the soils, how much carbon. We also looked at how much nitrogen is there. Um, and I'm just going to skip to the results. Um, and show you what we found. So first, we found that forage production 
and thus carbon inputs differed across farms, but not as a function of pasture management. So um, here, this um, figure is showing three different panels representing our three different farms, Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine. Um, we are collecting um, uh, samples every week over the growing season, so from you know, May through October. And what you're seeing on the y-axis is cumulative carbon and above ground biomass. The areas that are in orange are grazed areas and the areas that are in gray are hay areas. That dark line is the median and then the shaded area is the 95% confidence interval. And um, when I look at this graph, what I see is that there's no difference, there's tons of overlap between the grazed and hay fields at all the farms but there's differences across farms, with our New Hampshire farm being lower than our Vermont and Maine farms. And this is a consistent pattern you're going to see, that our New Hampshire farm is underperforming. Okay, so no difference in productivity. So that's input. What do we see in terms of output? Well, we see that soil carbon dioxide emissions vary between sampling years, so here we're looking at two different sampling years, and also among farms, but not with pasture management. So here, um, these two figures, the one on the left is showing two different years that we took measurements, 2016 and 2017. What we're looking at is the total amount of carbon dioxide that is lost from those soils over the course of the season. And we lost more in 2017 and 2016, which makes sense because 2016 was a historic drought, super dry. So I would expect uh, microbial activity, root activity to be low when there's not a lot of water. So um, we see differences between years. We also see differences across farms. So, you know, we have higher fluxes in Vermont and Maine than in New Hampshire. Again, New Hampshire is the lowest one. But no differences with grazing management. That's for carbon dioxide. But we're also interested in nitrous oxide. So what do we see there? Well, we see nitri nitrous oxide emissions. They also differ among farms. And they differ with pasture management especially in 2017. So this is a different, little bit of a different setup. On the left, we have total nitrous oxide fluxes over the course of the season for our three farms. And on the right, we're showing differences between grazed field, fields and hay fields. In 2016, we don't see a difference. In 2017, we do. And the grazed fields had more nitrous oxide emissions than the hay fields. So we're seeing higher outputs in the way of N2O with um, management intensive rotational grazing. Okay, what about stocks? Okay, so we sampled um, soils and looked at how much carbon and nitrogen were in them. We see that with carbon, there's no difference with pasture management. So these are our three farms, Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine. The orange bars are um, fields that are managed for grazing. The gray bars are fields that are managed for hay. And there's no difference in the total carbon stock um, with management, even though there are differences across farms. Again, New Hampshire has the lowest amount of carbon up there. So they're showing the same pattern everywhere. Nitrogen stocks also followed a similar pattern um, where we see differences with, um, with farm, but we also see differences with management. So this is, you know, a small difference, but it's statistically significant where we have more nitrogen in the soils and the grazed fields than we do in the hay fields. We have more nitrous oxide emissions, and we have more nitrogen in those soils. And so just to sort of summarize the results of that first project, um, in terms of inputs, we see forage productivity, at least above ground, does not change. Outputs, N2O emissions, nitrous oxide emissions are higher in grazed pastures. Stocks, soil carbon didn't change, but soil nitrogen increased. Okay, so that was our first study where we're looking across three different farms and we're sampling fields that are in continuous grazing management or continuous hay management. Um, we also had this really unique opportunity to look at change over time. So we had one farm that we were able to, to monitor how soil carbon changed over a transition from just hay field into a rotational grazing system. And this took place at the UNH Organic Dairy Research Farm. Um, this is actually uh, a really cool farm in the sense that it was the first 
and for a while the only organic dairy research farm at a land-grant university in the United States. And so um, it was unique in that respect. Now Minnesota has one, so we're not the only one. But, um, but one of the things that was really exciting about this farm to me when I started working there is that um, these soils were sampled prior to the conversion into organic management, and that was done by Tim Griffin here at Tufts. <laughs> Um, before he came here. So he had the foresight to think, maybe we should, you know, take some soil samples, or a lot of them, and, and, uh, and see what's there, and then see what happens after um, this farm has gone through a transition into grazing management. And so I um, got excited about this when I was a postdoc, and, and was sort of determined to follow up on this. And, um, and so 10 years later, we had the chance to revisit all of these, all of these sampling points and, and um, resample the soils. And so this is just a, an aerial view of the UNH Organic Dairy Research Farm, all the buildings you can kind of see in the upper right. These um, areas that are outlined in black are different pastures, um, and the points that are in yellow were sampled in 2006, the points that are in red are sampled in 2007. It doesn't mean different management, it's just they were sampled in two different years. There's a lot of points here, and um, there actually are more soil samples than there are points because each of these points represents five cores, right? So this is like a huge amount of work that was done um, prior to the organic dairy becoming the organic dairy. So um, the cows first showed up in 2007 in January. And so um, this is a great sort of baseline soil sample collection. And we went back and resampled these in 2017. So our pre-sampling was in 2006 and 2007, and our post-sampling is in 2017. Again, each of those points is actually five soil cores. Um, the cores were taken just to 15 centimeters, so we're looking at the surface, and we analyzed them for total carbon and total nitrogen. Um, we call these, whenever we're trying to talk about this project, we talk, call these the Swiss cheese blocks because we feel like we made the fields into Swiss cheese with all the holes. But. Yeah. Um, okay, so what do we see? All right, well, these two figures are showing um, change in carbon. So what was carbon in the initial sampling? Um, and in 2017, in the gray fields, which are in the green colors, and in the hay fields, which are in the purple. And we did see, okay, over 10 years, if we sampled the entire farm, yes, carbon went up. Right, went up a little bit. It went up mm, maybe a quarter of a percent if you're looking at the median value. No difference with hay, right? So we didn't see that increase, at least not statistically significant increase with hay. We also see an increase in nitrogen, right? So not only did carbon go up, nitrogen also went up. This is the same setup, only here we're looking at percent nitrogen instead of percent carbon in the gray fields and in the hay fields. They went up with the grazed fields, but not with the hay fields. So it's just similar to what we saw. We're looking across all those farms. And so just to sort of summarize what we found in these first two projects that are very much focused on measurements, we see that soil carbon stocks didn't differ when, with pasture management when we're comparing among fields. Um, you know, if we're looking at grazed versus hay, um, but they did increase when we are monitoring them over time, right? So we have this nice baseline soil sampling and we can detect some change over time. But we also see that these higher soil carbon stocks may be related to drawbacks. So we also see in the grazed pastures increases in soil nitrogen and in nitrous oxide emissions. So the question then is why? And this is what, you know, we struggle with all the time, you know, when we have lab meetings and they're talking about our data. So first, I think um, it's important to remember, why don't we see these huge increases in soil organic matter, soil organic carbon? We do see a little bit when we, when we look at that one farm and change over time. But I think this accumulation depends on initial system conditions. So, you know, a lot of the, um, not all, but some of the places where we've seen big gains in soil carbon are places that have been under a plow, right? You have lots of tillage, lots of soil disturbance, like those soil carbon cowboys. And if you put in a perennial grassland to stabilize that soil and start to prevent erosion and increase organic inputs, it may be more likely that you're going to see gains in carbon. 
than if you already start out with the perennial grassland and you just start to manage it in a different way. Um, there also are probably tons of other factors that are really important. Um, soil texture, right? So we have three different farms, and each of those have different soil properties. And the farm that we were able to sample over to look at change over time had the sandiest soil. So soils that have finer texture, more silt, more clay, are better able to hold on to carbon than sandy soil, right? So it may be that we're not, this was not the best model system for us to be working in. Um, what's the forage composition in, in these farms, right? And does that differ with management? We don't know, right? So if we have um, lots of legumes that take up nitrogen and fix it in our grazed field, is that going to affect the nitrogen cycle? That could be a reason. What about the stocking rate? Right? How, how densely are these animals stocked and how frequently are they being rotated? That's something that has been hugely difficult for us to, to get answers on. Um, there aren't super great records um, within these farms for how that happens. And rotational grazing means a different thing to pretty much every single person I talk to. And so what rotational grazing is to the farm manager at the UNH Organic Dairy is very different to what it was to the family farm in Vermont. Um, and then it's also, you know, soil is so highly heterogeneous that it might be very difficult to, to detect change across the landscape. And we're only able to detect any change when we, we sample all those hundreds of points, which is maybe unrealistic sampling effort if you're trying to talk about scaling this up to a bigger system. Um, and all of these issues of how hard it is to detect, if you can detect it at all, how some of these other uh, variables may play out is really important when you're talking about trying to craft policy or, you know, base industry on this. It might be just really, really hard to measure, if not really, really hard to do. Um, but despite all of the variability that we see in our study systems, we still see this increase in nitrogen in the soil, and we still see this increase in nitrous oxide emissions. And so I think that's also really important to consider because managing for soil organic matter storage and soil carbon storage may have unintended consequences, right, that I think are really important to keep in mind. Okay, so I'm just going to briefly talk about our last um, project, um, which is trying to use models to explore rotational grazing and soil processes. And this is something that we're deep in the weeds on right now. Um, but I just wanted to sort of explain why we're using models, um, because we can use models to explore some of the mechanisms that we think are really important in these systems, and also explore possibilities to drive the system in ways that might be really hard to do in real life. So some of the questions we're trying to answer with our modeling is are, you know, what are the factors driving change over time? Is it manure? Is it plant composition? Is it stocking density? What is it? How can we force the system to gain bigger benefits, right? Do we graze less time? Do we graze more time? Do we leave more plant biomass within the field? We can maybe identify where soil organic matter can be increased, right? Which soils and which systems have the greatest potential to hold on to carbon? And also explore some of the trade-offs. Where can we maximize organic matter increase, minimize emissions, maximize biomass yield? We can try to play with the model to to help us understand those um, answers to those questions and then either test them in the field or find places that are doing that and sort of validate the model. Um, it wouldn't be fair to talk about modeling without showing one sort of blow your mind model conceptual diagram. Um, and this is of the denitrification decomposition model, which is what we're using. Um, and essentially what we're talking about, this model has all kinds of different things in it that represent soil climate and plant growth and decomposition and different parts of the nitrogen cycle and the methane cycle. But what we're trying to do with the model is change some of the things that force the model, change soil type, change vegetation, change human activity in terms of management, and then see what the model tells us, right? And then we can test our understanding of how we might be able to push the system and then again, see if we can then test that knowledge by doing field experiments or see if we can find people who are already doing that and validate our understanding. It's really hard to do this, though, um, because of all the challenges that go along with rotational grazing. It turns out that sometimes the model doesn't grow grass. This is one of the biggest problems we've had with trying to implement really intensive rotational grazing in models the cows eat everything and then they starve, right? 
the grass doesn't really grow within a season sometimes. So that's a huge modeling challenge that we've been trying to figure out how to reparameterize. The fences move, right? So these are two hand-drawn maps of the paddocks in one of the fields at the UNH Organic Dairy um, for two different years. And so not only do the fences move and there are the cows in different places at different times, that differs between years. 2015 was a normal year. So you see these small paddocks and the cows are in there for you know, maybe 12 hours at a time. 2016 was when we had the drought. So you have huge paddocks and you know they're in there for longer periods of time. How do you model that, right? It represents a really big problem. Um, the other thing that is super hard is trying to follow the manure, right? Because um, there aren't a lot of data for like, w like where is the manure coming from? Is it composted? How long was it composted? What's the carbon amount in the manure? What's the nitrogen amount in the manure? Um, like, did it get applied, you know, in November or in December, right? Not just late fall. Like, how much is in a load? Like, all these questions that are really going to matter for what the input is into the system. Um, and we think this might be really key to understanding changes in the nitrogen in particular. So we're trying to figure out how, how to follow the manure a little better. Um, but ultimately, we're trying to come up with some solutions, maybe try to simplify the paddocks a little bit. Moving forward, I would love to have GPS collars in the animals so I know where they are and when they're there, and I'm not trying to take a hand-drawn map and figure out what that means in the, in the real world. Maybe you could mark fences. Maybe we could gather more data in a more open-source way so that we're not trying to find someone's handwritten notes about where and when manure was applied five years ago, right? But if it was more digital, something that could be input through a phone that could be shared by the research community, that would be really helpful. Maybe we can use remote sensing data sets from satellites to understand what's the plant nitrogen composition on these fields and how is that changing over time if we don't have those, those data in hand. Um, but ultimately, we're trying to do this model exploration, again, to, to explore rotational grazing and soil processes to sort of scale up from the site to the farm ecosystem and then maybe even higher so that we can, can gain some understanding of whether and how it's possible to store, store carbon and how we might be able to reduce trade-offs. Um, really, to try to answer this question, can dirt save the earth, right? This is an um, a article in the New York Times Magazine that came out about a year ago, and something that I'm really interested in. Uh, so with that, I'm just going to say thank you and take questions. Regarding the challenges uh, collecting all the data that you were just talking about at the end there, is there promise from, um, like, it seems like if every individual were making all these recordings on their own, then that wouldn't be such a challenge for one researcher to be going and collecting. It would just be about compiling it. So then that makes me think of places like Indigo Ag who are pushing to be doing all this data collection everywhere. Mm -hmm. Is there hope? I don't know everything about Indigo or alternative, like similar companies. Is there any like movement in that era or in that arena for these good purposes, not just to help make more profit, I guess? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't, not, I don't necessarily think making profit is at odds with doing good, right? So, um, but I think uh, that's, that's a different model with Indigo, right? So there you have a sort of top-down model. There's also the potential for it to be a little bit more democratic and bottom-up, right? So farmers, uh, collecting their own data and then sharing them in a way that can be more localized and available to researchers, but that's a little bit more, um, a little bit more coming from the grassroots. And uh, so that's something that I'm tangentially involved with, um, and really interested in, but it might help to solve some of the, the gray literature problem that we have to kind of get data to put into models or understand, like, why do we see more nitrogen? We think it might be the norm, but we don't know. Even just like having those records would be really useful outside of modeling. 
You talked a lot about different soil types. Has there been um, any consideration for it? I know you talked about native grasses, but growing different types of grasses that might help the sequestration? Yeah, so that's something that we are really interested in exploring, both in a modeling framework and also in a field framework. Like, what if we planted annual grasses? Then what would happen, right? What if we, um, you know, really did super aggressive rotations with really mega high stocking rates, like mob grazing? Then what would we get? What would we get, right? So it's a matter of like um, trying to. The model helps us to test the sensitivity of to some of those different management practices and our understanding of how they might play out. But then it's also a question of finding people uh, who are here in our part of the world, if we're interested in New England as our study system, willing to do those things, um, to, to, to take on those experiments. And so yeah, that's something that I'm super interested in. Hi, thank you so much. That was really very interesting. So my question is about the nitrous oxide emissions. This is fantastic because if you're thinking about um, climate change, clearly you have to consider uh, nitrous oxide. So my question is, has anyone else started studying this or thought about this, or are people just kind of blindly studying soil um, carbon sequestration without thinking about other impacts? And then beyond who else is potentially doing this, what other um, issues might we be missing? in this effort to sequester carbon? Yes, yeah, so um, I'm not the first person to think of this nitrous oxide question. Um, there were some people who came before me. Uh, I showed a graph from that one paper. There's not a lot, right? So um, there has been some more work in um, cultivated systems, trying to compare something like a no-till system where um, where there is you know, either little to no uh, tillage versus a tilled system and looking at the, not just the carbon gains, but also the potential trade-offs of N2O. And you do see, um, I'm thinking of a particular study in Canada that in no-till, in soils that have more clay, you see higher nitrous oxide emissions. Um, so that's just one study that comes to mind. So it's, I'm not the, the first person to spot that, but it's not really, I think, on the radar. Um, the other thing that we're also interested in is um, not just gaseous loss of nitrate, but a next step for us is um, uh, uh, gaseous loss of nitrous oxide, but loss of nitrate into aquatic systems. And so that's something that we haven't measured within the context of this study, but that's also super mobile and uh, you know, could, could um, be a bad actor for water quality. Thank you for a very nice presentation. Uh, in the greater scheme of things, uh, the magnitude, the potential magnitude, and maybe this is too early days to answer this question, but the potential magnitude of carbon uh, sequestration uh, in the soil uh, compared to other methods uh, uh, to reduce greenhouse gas uh, in the atmosphere, mm -hmm. such as not having cows graze on the land. What what is that? Yeah, so, you know. So in the greater scheme of things, you know, is this going to be potentially a very large contributor or a modest contributor? Yeah, I mean, I guess I don't I don't know in terms of like how big a contributor it could be. I had an interesting conversation with a farmer yesterday who was asking me about multi paddock grazing and can I farm carbon, um, and he was saying, you know, some people really think the cows are the problem, but I think it's not the cow, but the how. That was his, his quote. Um, which, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm open but skeptical. I think um, for me in doing this work, my primary motivation was to try to get some hard, some hard data to, to, to see like what's the potential if it even exists versus there's kind of these like evangelists out there about grazing and its potential to store carbon and very few data points on the ground. Personally, I think that the potential is somewhat small, but that's, you know, I wouldn't be confident to say relative to some other strategy. How much could we get? Um, thank you for your presentation. This this question sort of builds on the previous question, so, and you kind of touched on it in your last few sentences. 
so given your findings and the impact on nitrous oxide emissions versus the potential to sequester carbon so your so your current take on um this form of intensive grazing is that would you advocate it in general or yeah so i think um Part of the hard, the hard part about answering that question is that the method itself is so, um, applies in such diverse ways that it's hard to even call it a method. You know, I had this conversation with um, the pasture management specialist with the NRCS, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, who's in charge of like helping farmers to route your hamster and manage their pastures about intensive grazing. And his comment to me was, I can't think of a single farmer in the state who's actually doing really um, aggressive rotational grazing anywhere. They think they are, but they're not, right? So I think, um, and, and I don't know that that's limited to New Hampshire either. So it's hard to know whether you can recommend a uh, management system or not when how that system is defined is so ambiguous and varies so much from farm to farm. And so I think there's a lot of you know, I hate to fall back on, like, we need to define this better, but it has to be, I think, a little bit better defined and constrained because it's, it's, it's highly, wildly variable how it's applied. So maybe it could, if it applied in a certain way, in a certain place, realize some gains, you know, but it would have to be the right place at the right time, and, and I don't even know how to look at it. Also, thank you for the presentation. Um, so if I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying any time that you're increasing the carbon in the soil, you're also necessarily increasing nitrogen, uh, like N2O being released into the atmosphere? Not necessarily. That's what we saw in this case, but that's okay. not always the case. So I'm just wondering how this then compares to systems not with cows, but with cover cropping just for vegetable crops and fields? Yeah, so, um, so this can play out with cover cropping as well. And actually, I, was, um, I saw a presentation at the USDA a couple years ago. It was one of these like project director meetings um, where this researcher found that during um, the tillage of sort of green manures and cover crops into soils, you saw huge emissions of nitrous oxide in that process. Um, and so that would you know, not be something that necessarily you would want or want to advertise. Now, whether that N2O loss outweighs the potential carbon or other benefits you might gain, like, I don't know. But yeah, that's been observed, especially if you have a lot of clover and legumes that get a lot of nitrogen from the atmosphere in your cover crop. Thank you for your presentation. Um, it would, have, would like a national scale study where it, maybe it's less controlled, but you're actually looking at the nuances of the different implementation of these more um, management intensive grazing systems. Um, would, would that sort of get it better answering this question or would something like, and, and increasing like the um, time period that you're doing this under, is something like that feasible or would you really look towards modeling? I think um, I would love to do that. So, um, and, and I think um, that could be possible. So, you know, I'm just thinking right now of the USDA. They have uh, these really large grants, the Sustainable Agricultural System competitions, where you can get eight or ten million dollars to do something huge on a national scale. So, you may not be able to work in you know, every farm in the United States, obviously, but you could work across farms in different regions that have sort of different soils and antecedent conditions and climates and maybe try to start to, to drill down on, you know, what some of the variability is and how it plays out. Um, the power of models is that then it allows you, if you can simulate something really well on the ground and you understand that system really well, then it allows you to scale up, right? If you have high confidence that the model is representing the system and is decently approximating reality, then that allows you to scale up and uh, know how a system might be behaving, even if you don't measure it very much, if you don't, even if you don't have a lot of measurements. And so if you're talking about trying to you know, do national scale policy, or um, if you're talking about industry, they're going to rely really heavily on models, because you can't be out there taking soil cores everywhere. It's just like impossible. 
But you have to have high confidence in the model. And to have high confidence in the models, you have to understand the system really well so you can parameterize them. But I think a bigger study would be awesome. And um, my colleagues and I are talking about maybe doing one of those, but I don't know if we're quite ready yet. And we might need to like, step towards that for the next few iterations of, of more work. Okay, last question. Thanks for your presentation. Um, coming back to what you said about the fact that intensive grazing isn't actually really defined, um, and the fact that a lot of Northeast dairies um, might are smaller and might only be operated by like one or two people, is there the worry at all that, and that you said that somebody else said that a lot of people think they are doing intensive grazing, but these farmers aren't actually, is there the worry that like management of being able to do something as intensive as this, maybe someone that people won't be able to keep up with if it's just themselves running the dairy? I mean, yeah, so I think they are doing some rotations, right? It's not like there's no rotations happening. It's not like it's not intensive. But I think this, um, like, super high stocking density for super short periods of time, I don't know that there's – I'm just – that's anecdotal, the story from the, the guy from the NRCS. Um, I don't know that there's a ton of people doing that. And maybe, maybe that would be hard to do and hard to keep up with. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, but – I'll chime in a second there. I've seen that only once with beef producers in the northeastern United States, and the guy who was doing, he was doing true mob grazing mm -hmm. and had great aesthetic results, um, and he was moving the animals multiple times a day. It was his full-time job, mm -hmm. so, which is often not feasible for producers, right? They have to have, they're having multiple jobs. Okay. All right, we'll, we'll end it there. Um, let's thank Dr. Contasta one more time for her great talk. And we'll see you next week.